Hi everybody, Mr. Chris here. So, so far in my life I have suffered through some very horrible things. A doctor had to stick a long needle behind my kneecap to extract a bunch of liquid so that I could walk. I had my tonsils cut out when I was about six years old and my wisdom teeth came in at all kinds of strange angles and had to be cut out in a very painful surgery. However, all of that pales, and I mean pales, when compared to the greatest horror of them all, and that would be being forced by my wife to ride my bike. I do not enjoy bike riding at all, but I married a woman who enjoys nothing better than a long bike ride. And on the very first date that I ever took my wife on, I, by some, <laughs> by some strike of ingenuity, took her on a bike ride. I had no idea how much she loved to ride bike, but it was a great choice. So the other day, um, I got our bikes down off their hooks in the garage. I checked the brakes, I tightened the seats, and I loaded them on the back of my old 1984 uh, 1984 uh, Dodge Dakota pickup and took them to use the free air compressor at the Harrisburg Eagle Mart gas station. There, I inflated the tires to a good hard level. Then, Steffi went for a bike ride and she kindly allowed me to stay at home. An hour and a half later, Steffi called me and she said, uh, I have a problem. <laughs> yeah, I said, you like to ride bikes. <laughs> Haha, ha, Steffi replied, my tire blew. So, uh, turns out, I'm pretty sure I drastically overinflated her tires, and the tire blew. So, that's what our lesson is about today. Inflation. And just like an overinflated bike tire, an overinflated economy can also blow to bits and cause all kinds of problems. Inflation is caused by an imbalance between the demand for goods and services and the amount of money in circulation to buy those goods and services. In today's class session, we'll begin by recapping the basics of inflation. Second, we'll look at three different scenarios that can cause inflation. And third, we'll look at the difference between Keynesian economic theories and supply side economic theories as they relate to inflation. Finally, we'll examine the Consumer Price Index, CPI, as a way of understanding inflation. Let's begin. First, we'll recap the basics of inflation. The economy works best when the dollar value of all the goods and services for sale and the number of dollars in circulation are nearly equal. So let's say there are three trillion dollars worth of goods and services to buy. And there are three trillion dollars in circulation. Perfect. Now, let's say that we Americans have a bad day at work and we crank out only $2.75 trillion worth of goods and services. Don't get hung up on the details here. Just think, okay, $2.75 trillion worth of goods and services to be bought. Now, uh, let's also say that the number of dollars in circulation remains at $3 trillion. So $2.75 trillion worth of stuff to buy, $3 trillion to buy them. Now, each dollar can buy fewer goods and services. Each dollar is now weaker. That is inflation. Now, let's say that Americans have an average day at work and we crank out $3 trillion worth of goods and services, but the government increases the number of dollars in circulation to $3.25 trillion. Now, each dollar can buy fewer goods and services each dollar is weaker. This also is inflation. Again, the root cause of inflation is an imbalance between the demand for goods and services and the amount of money in circulation to buy those goods and services. Now, let's move on to discuss three different scenarios that can cause inflation. The first one is called demand pool inflation. In this scenario, people demand more of a particular kind of good or service. 
producers can't meet the demand, so they raise prices. In the meantime, the number of US dollars in circulation stays the same. And since the price of the goods and the services consumers are demanding have gone up, those dollars can now buy fewer things. This is inflation. Increased demand drives prices up while the amount of money in circulation stays the same. Let's look at an example of demand pool inflation. <clears throat> when the economy is doing well, people like to update their older cars by buying new cars. When the demand for new cars goes up, dealerships begin charging more for these spiffy new wheels so they can meet demand. Now each dollar in your pocket now buys a little bit less because the prices of new cars have gone up. So thanks new Tesla drivers. The second scenario is called cost push inflation. In this scenario, producers are forced to raise prices for the goods or services they are producing because their production costs have gone up. In the meantime, the number of US dollars in circulation stays the same. And since the prices of the goods and services these producers are supplying have gone up, those dollars can now buy fewer things. This is also inflation. Increased production costs drive prices up while the amount of money in circulation stays the same. Now let's go back to our new cars. In this scenario, the production costs for new cars rises. So let's say there's a steel shortage. Now Tesla has to charge more for each car to cover the increased cost of making each car. The increased cost for each Tesla means every dollar in your pocket is now worth a little bit less. So maybe the Amish with the horses and buggies are actually onto something. Okay, let's move on to our third and final scenario. Inflation can result from the federal government funding welfare programs. <laughs> welfare programs, like all federal spending, is funded through a combination of tax dollars clawed from the hands of individuals and businesses and borrowed money, mostly in the form of government bonds. Welfare programs tend to have a triple whammy effect on the economy. First, taxes decrease the amount of money that individuals and businesses have to spend or save. Now, this isn't tied necessarily to welfare programs. It's just tied to taxes as a whole. The more people are taxed, the less money they have to spend or save. Second, when the government borrows money, it competes with individuals and businesses to borrow that money. Competition drives up the interest rates for loans, which makes loans tougher to get as an individual or a business. And this lowers the number of dreams and schemes that individuals and businesses can fund, which is bad for the economy. Now, once again, government, the government borrowing money isn't necessarily a welfare problem. It's a problem whenever government borrows money. But finally, and third, Free money given to welfare recipients increases the amount of money in circulation without increasing the number of goods or services being provided. Now, typically, people earn money by helping to produce something of value, but when free money is given out, this balance isn't maintained because people are receiving money without having actually produced something. Now, this isn't to say that all welfare programs are a bad idea. I mean, obviously, um, there are people who can't work. There are people who need to be taken care of. And so it's not necessarily welfare problems that are necessarily the issue. It's widespread welfare problems where people are actually being... Um, when people actually uh, are being incentivized to, stay, uh, to, to get onto welfare programs instead of working. So when free money is given out, this balance isn't maintained. More money chasing fewer things causes inflation. Now, let's look at an example of this. In the 1960s, President Lyndon B. Johnson, who took over after President Kennedy was tragically shot in 1963, waged a war on poverty. He envisioned a great society in which no one lived in poverty. To achieve this goal, he oversaw a massive expansion of federal welfare programs. Meanwhile, the U.S. was also embroiled in a frustrating war in Vietnam. This war was really expensive, as was the funding of the Great Society campaign. 
the federal government was forced to borrow lots of money to fund both of these different projects. This spending helped contribute to an economic slump in the 1970s. Okay, now that we've examined these three different scenarios that can cause inflation, let's turn our attention to two different economic theories as they relate to inflation and as they relate to solving the US economic problems that developed in the 1970s. Now, in general, economists have two different theories about how to solve an economic slump. Let's start with the Keynesian theory. Keynesianism argues that a government needs to borrow and spend money freely during a recession, especially in the form of paying workers to build and repair roads, dams, and bridges. When workers are paid well, they spend that money, and this gets the economy going. However, when the government dumps money into the economy, it ends up causing inflation because there's not a corresponding increase in the value of goods and services that can be bought with that money. So, Keynesianism often can actually cause greater problems than it solves. Supply-side economics, championed by President Ronald Reagan in the 1980s, argues that the government can kickstart the economy not by spending a lot, but rather by lowering taxes. They argue that when individuals and businesses have more money to spend, they tend to invest that money into more business ventures and expansions of businesses that already exist. And those new ventures and those expansions provide more jobs for more people, which means more money is now in circulation. Reagan followed this theory of supply-side economics, and it at least partially is the reason for the economic boom in the U.S. economy during the 1980s and the 1990s. Now, let's turn to examine the Consumer Price Index. The CPI is based on the cumulative price for a basket of goods. So what types of things are in this basket of goods? They are typical things that most people need to live in America. Things like housing, transportation, clothes, and food. The government tracks the average price of each of the items in this basket of goods, then adds up all the prices to find the sum total. The sum totals from each year are then compared to one another, and using this tool, we can see how prices have risen because of inflation. The CPI is based on the sum total for the price of goods in the basket of goods from 1982 to 1984. This is called the base period. It is given a value of 100. This doesn't mean that the basket of goods was worth $100 in 1982 to 1984. It simply means the number 100 is being used as the starting point for comparison. In fact, a good way of thinking about the CPI is to think of the numbers given for each year as a percent. Now, let's take a look at this chart. This chart shows the CPI over the last 25 years. As you can see, there's been a general upward trajectory in the price of the basket of goods over the last 25 years. Now, let's see what the actual number is right now. March of 2020 has the CPI at 257.95. Let's break down what that means exactly. The base period of 1982 to 1984 is given a value of 100. As of March of 2020, we have a CPI of 257.95. To make sense of this, of this, let's turn it into a percent. Let's take 257.95 and subtract the base period amount, which is 100. That leaves us with the number 157.95. That means that the basket of goods cost 157.95% more than it did in 1984. Now, in other words, the basket of goods costs over twice as much as it did during the base period. Now, let me show you one other fun chart that really makes, uh, that helps to illustrate inflation. This one compares the prices of Big Macs over time. In 1986, which is the earliest date I could get a price for a Big Mac, a Big Mac cost a buck fifty. In 1990, it was about two bucks, and by 2000, it still hovered around that price. But by 2010, it had skyrocketed to around three seventy-five. In 2020, a Big Mac costs four bucks. Now let's see how the Big Mac compares with the CPI. The CPI says the prices of the basket of goods 
has increased 2.57 times. So you take the price of the basket of goods in 1982 to 1984, and you multiply it times 2.57, and you'll have the price of goods today. That means that the price of the goods then is between two and three times as expensive as it was, uh, two and th three times more expensive now than it was back in 1982 to 1984. Now, let's start with the 1986 price for a Big Mac. It's also, uh, this is the earliest price that I could get for a Big Mac, but it's also close to the base period for the CPI. The price in 1986 for a Big Mac was $1.50. The price for a Big Mac now is $4. Let's take $4 and divide it by $1.50. That's 2.67. So that means that a Big Mac now costs 2.67 times as much as it did back in 1986. So while the CPI shows that the basket of goods costs 2.57 times as much as in the base period, our calculations show that a Big Mac costs 2.6 times as much as in 1986. So it's pretty, pretty, pretty close to being the same. Well, I would say that inflation, by decreasing the amount that each dollar can buy, leads to us having not such a happy meal. Mr. Chris out.